Let's get that going. That's okay. Uh, before we get started, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I noticed that you posted the Zoom recording for both sections from last week. Do you suggest that we review the other section uh, lecture material or is that just no. optional? That's just optional. I just okay. did it to, I didn't, couldn't decide whether it was gonna be more confusing to just post one and have the other section not know what was going on or to post both and let you all figure it out. I ended up posting both and figured that you just watch one of them. Okay. Both sections are going to be as identical as I can make them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so really whatever, yeah, whatever we do here at 10 a.m., I'm essentially just going to repeat at 3 p.m. later today, all Pacific time. Um, some of the course I try to make engaging, like I'll ask you all questions. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen a lot today, but as we go through the semester, I'm going to try to ask for people to speak and interact and say things. Um, and so there might be different examples that show up in the other sections, just purely based on student response and what people say during a lecture. But uh, for the most part, the content is going to be identical. Uh, I think that was David. Thanks, David. Uh, any other questions before we get going? Um, is there a way to like not record our faces? Because like I noticed that my, my teacher last semester recorded, but like we always had our videos on, but it, it didn't usually show our faces like when he uploaded the videos. I don't know how to do that. I would. You could turn, you could turn off speaker view in your settings um, when you record your session. It I either can record speaker view or um, um, like overall view and if you record like overall just your screen it'll only record you and then otherwise it'll flash to the person's face when they talk okay i am looking for that setting i'm not sure if it's something you have to change before you enter the recording or not. before you start. yeah i think it's before you start recording Thanks, AJ, for the feedback. Um, I don't know who just asked that question. Can we compromise and say I'll look into it next round so I don't get distracted searching through all my uh, options right now? Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. We're getting some good questions. What else we got? Another question I had is, are there any um, stipulations about what can and cannot go into the, uh, the notes from uh, our markdown. So are, can we put stuff from this lecture in there or would you prefer that we only put stuff from the textbook or do you have any guidelines for that? So what I've tried to do in the syllabus and uh, in the first video was lay out a minimum requirement. Right. And from there, Christian, anything you wanna put in there that might help future Christian is right. totally worth it. Okay, thank you. Cool, yeah. All right, what else we got? I'm gonna go shut a door, but. Continue to ask questions if you have them. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Has everybody here seen sets before? In oh. discrete math, briefly. Okay, so some of us have seen sets, some of us haven't. If I see something, it might jog my memory, but right now I'll say no. Okay, good. We're gonna go through them. If you've seen them before, by all means, um, shout out what you, um, what thoughts you have about sets. If you haven't seen sets before, uh, they're really not that bad. Mathematical sets are just a collection of unique elements. Uh, let's say objects. And really, I just mean any kind of noun here. Objects is just like the noun of whatever. Objects can mean numbers. It often will mean numbers in the world of math. But a set is just a collection of unique objects. I don't care what those objects are. Uh, we write them, that is sets, with curly braces. 
and y'all are going to have to, um, you know, deal with the fact that I'm trying to write on like one of these uh, pen tablets here and my handwriting is not as good as it normally is. So you'll have to just make believe that that's a curly brace. <laughs> are we all willing to accept that as a left curly brace? Yeah, Edward, I am. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> That's exactly what mine looked like in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, okay, what are you all interested in? Somebody give me a topic here that you're interested in and we'll create a set of things uh, based off whatever you're interested in. Space. Space? Okay, so how about planets? Yeah. Okay, here we go, you ready? Earth, here is a set of planets. Earth, Mars, uh, Jupiter. Can I list Jupiter again? No. Nope. Why not? Because there's, um, there's only one, but also because it's a set of unique objects. Uh -huh. Okay, good talk. Uh, what am I missing here? Let's Mercury. See. There's Uranus, Mercury. Yeah, I was going for Uranus, but I messed up my U. Mercury. Where do we stand on Pluto these days, y'all? Bring Pluto back. I'm trying to start a new- Listen, uh, I think bring Pluto back. Bring Pluto, <laughs> Pluto back indeed. Smaller than the moon. <laughs> Neptune. Uh, Neptune. Neptune, thanks. Okay, how about one more? Are we done? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There we go. Here, we'll call this set P for planets. How about another set A? Okay, what was the next one up? Uh, was it dogs? Yeah. Uh, I don't know too many dogs. Okay, so I have a lab. I have a lab named Diego. You'll meet him sometime this semester, almost surely. Pitbull. Pitbull. Border Collie. Queens, Queens, Queensland Healer, sorry. Queensland Healer. Alaskan dogs. It was my bet. It was my favorite dog that I had. It was my childhood dog. Aren't the healers uh, super anxious and hyper and? No, they're really, really, really good with kids. They're sheep dogs. Okay. But they okay. always had a boss. Dachshund. Uh, docks. I don't know how to spell Shih Tzu. Dachshund. Come on, people. Give me ones I can spell. Alaskan Malamu. <laughs> you deliberately tried there, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Chihuahua. Wow. Do I have to name all of them? This is a question about definition of sets. In order to have a set, do I have to have all the things out there? We didn't nope. name all planets. Uh, I heard two people talking at once. I think the answer was no. The correct answer is no. You do not have to name all the things that possibly exist in the world of dogs in order to have a set about dogs. It would depend on the definition of set. As I have it, it's just a collection of unique objects. So your set does not have to include all dogs possible or, okay, our set happens to include all po uh, planets possible, but it doesn't have to. So we're just going with a set is a collection of unique objects. Are we okay with the examples given so far? Does anybody need a third example or have a follow-up question on our uh, definition of sets? Okay, good. Y'all are gonna see me do this sort of stuff often. And what I'm essentially trying to do is save our lecture notes for you. So I'm going to try to give us a PDF of all the lecture notes that I write up. You're going to have them recorded in this session anyway, but I like to get them in PDF form also. So I'm trying to give them to you as that as well. To me, that is the capital letter S. We are going to often reference a universal set or a sample space 
in this class. And so we're often going to imagine our sets are embedded in some larger space. So like our set A, which in which we listed some of the species of dogs, is embedded in a larger set we're going to almost always reference as capital S of all possible dogs. So we're just going to go ahead and assume that almost all of our sets are embedded in some universal or sample space set that we're going to denote capital S. When it comes to R, uh, when it comes to numbers, we're often imagining our set of numbers is embedded in this bigger space, something like the real numbers or the integers or um, the natural numbers. And those are going to be examples of sets for us later on. So if you don't know what the real numbers or natural numbers or integers are, we will come to that soon. Uh, that's supposed to be or. So I'm trying to give a synonym for the name a universal set. Is that or clearer? Yeah, totally. Okay. So here we go. Here's some more bullet points about sets. Um, the object within the set are referred to as elements. So Earlier, we had that set of planets, and we would say Earth is in P. This is how we write the element Earth is a member of, is an element of the set P. This is like a little C with a little dash in it. It's almost like a capital letter curly E made small. Are we okay with that silly little symbol? Yeah, Edward, it looks okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I'm looking for, people. It takes a lot to like lean forward and unmute myself. Uh, yeah. So much effort. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. You can in hold down the space bar too. In LaTeX, which you guys are going to type out in your R markdown notes within dollar signs, because that's how you enter math mode, you'll go backslash in. Because then if you're trying to write that there's like an element A in the set A, this literally will become, yeah, totally, AJ, thanks for doing the Unicode in the chat. This will totally become A in A. Yeah, if you know how to enter Unicode, AJ is helping us out. Otherwise, we're going to stick to LaTeX because that's going to be a little bit easier. OK, are we all OK with this silly little symbol to mean in? And we're OK with calling the object of sets elements? Yeah. Thank you. There we have it. Uh. Oh, Natalie, if you don't know Unicode, uh, that one's in a world of, of computer science mess. Uh, the world of characters, like, uh, yeah, uh, the world of characters on a computer is terribly complex. It's this, uh, you've ever heard the expression, it's turtles all the way down? Well, it's abstractions all the way down for, um, for writing characters on a computer. And Unicode is some universal set of possible letters that you can display on a computer. Uh, and one of the possible options you have to display in Unicode is this uh, little symbol we use to mean in for set 
inclusion for an element is a member of a set. Um, but you can do Unicode for all the characters you see on your screen. Unicode covers many different languages. Uh, Unicode covers many different math symbols. Unicode covers all the emojis that you write out on your phone. Unicode is this uh, crazy big set of characters people use to write out on digital machines. That's gonna be my best, best go for an off the cuff of Unicode. When an object is not an element of a set, we write X is not in A. So we write that little in symbol, but then we put a slash through it, almost like you're doing something like uh, not equals to. This is X is not in the set A. So this would be like Pluto not in P, the set of planets. I know, it's terribly disappointing. Thanks, NASA. Okay, everybody okay with not in? Oh, let's do it in LaTeX. In LaTeX, you will write backslash not backslash in, and not will just magically know that it should slash out the um, thing in front of it. <laughs> Joseph's taking offense to Pluto not being a planet. Sorry, me. <laughs> Okay, here we go. What else we got? Um, sorry, just looking through my notes so I get everything um, in order. Subsets. The set A is a subset of the set B if whenever X is in A, that implies X is in B. We write A is a subset of B. And if you want to think of this in terms of some of the sets we were using earlier, you could do something like Earth and Mars is a subset of P. So that's OK. In LaTeX, thanks, we use backslash subset. Oops. And so my idea, my thinking here with giving you all this LaTeX code is um, you should take this and type it into our markdown as like something to practice as you go. Maybe when you're writing yourself an example, you just try out these, this code inside our markdown and then hope that it works. And when it doesn't, you can ask me questions on why. Is that a C and then a line underneath it? That is basically a C and then a line underneath it. Yes. It is basically a C and then a line underneath it. Uh, the only real difference I would say is that the C isn't on like the bottom of whatever make-believe line that you're writing on. The C is kind of lifted up a little bit so that that line underneath it um, becomes more obvious. Excuse me, Edward. Yeah. Um, are these uh, definitions gonna go in our course notes? Yes, please. Okay. Okay, so here's that C with no line underneath it. A is a subset of B, but A, is not equal to B. We call that a proper subset. If A is a strict subset of B, but A cannot be equal to B, then some people will just use that little C. But without the line underneath it. 
Okay, cool. We're just gonna keep this moving. So just to clarify, when it was the the subset and either equal to when it had the line under it, that's a improper subset. Sure. Okay. Uh, I can't say I come across the phrase improper subset that often. Most of the time, I just think of it as a subset. But I guess okay. that is as the language suggests. So yeah. Okay. Okay, here we go. The empty set Let me see if I can fix up empty for us. That's a pretty atrocious writing of it. Okay, the empty set has its own special symbol. This is like a zero with a slash through it. The slash is usually supposed to be more um, even through the zero. Let's see if I can give you a better empty set. Sure, that's a little bit better. This is the set with no elements in it. If you were gonna write this out with curly braces, you just go like this. We've got to be careful though. A lot of people, uh, yeah, this is also called the null set. Um, a lot of people will want to imagine that this is equal to this, but it is not. Okay. We got to pay particular attention to this notation. I'm not going to suggest that everybody likes this notation immediately, but this notation is standard in math and it's important. This symbol means the set with no elements in it. So that's just curly brace, nothing in between, and curly brace. Hey, give me a second and I'll show you how to write empty set in um, uh, LaTeX. This set here. When I circle something with this, do you all see my cursor? Yeah. Okay, good, thanks. This set here, the outer set, happens to be a set that includes the empty set. So that cannot be equal to the empty set itself because the outer set here contains an element it happens to contain the empty set. Is that obnoxious? I thought it was the first time I saw it. In LaTeX, you can go backslash empty set. Oh, okay, I see we're responding in, in chat. Yes, that is obnoxious, indeed. We got to be super careful with our empty set. The empty set has absolutely nothing in it. If you have a set with the empty set contained in it, then the original set has an element. The element is the empty set. Yeah, I know. Oh, math, why do you do it to us? Two sets. A and B are said to be equal when each is a subset of the other. And so I don't mean proper here, so I'm just gonna leave it out. I mean uh, improper, as Christian was saying. So A is equal to B if A is a subset of B and B is a subset of A. Now, I'm not going to 
drag you through a bunch of these proofs in this class of trying to prove that two sets are equal. The uh, definition usually um, upsets people because you have to prove that any element in A is a subset of B and then separately any element of B is a subset of A. And it seems like you shouldn't have to go both ways, but it really does uh, matter that you prove both ways in order to get A equal to B. So it doesn't matter what kind of set we have. If we have a subset, then the set has at least one element. It doesn't matter. OK, so I'm going to try to answer this question in the chat. And I think if I'm interpreting the question is, uh, correctly, I think the answer is no, because the empty set is always an element of stuff. OK, so I got the first uh, question answered. The second question is, couldn't you sufficiently prove that if you have found that A is a subset of B and A and B have the same number of elements? That off the top of my head, Brandon, should work. That is not the standard way to prove set equality. but as far as I can imagine right now, it should work. I don't know how much easier that is to prove than the other method. So uh, yeah, that's a good follow-up. Okay, so my answer to your first question in the chat, Brendan, is I think that works, but I'm not gonna make that an official answer because I wanna think about it for a little bit longer. And your follow-up uh, point is really good because we're quickly going to get into sets where it's very hard to count the number of elements. Once we start doing probability problems, what we're essentially going to be doing is counting the number of elements in sets. And I stand by it. Counting is one of the hardest things you can do in math. This is, uh, I'm going to take this one till the day I die. One of the hardest things you can do in math is count. So I don't know if proving that two sets have the same number of elements is any easier than just proving that they're each a subset of the other. OK, here's another fact that nobody asked about, but it's good to note. Uh, a set is always a subset of itself. Cool. Uh, sets are transitive. Have y'all ever heard the word? I've seen people get fired for not being able to count. I really hope people don't get fired for not being able to count. I think what you're going to find out uh, in this class is that counting is really hard. You should get fired for that. Okay, sets are transitive. If A is a subset of B and B is a subset of C, then A is a subset of C. We call that transitive. That one's pretty cool. I like that one. That one comes up every now and again. OK, let's bring in a bunch more examples. We're going to do examples of sets of numbers. So our first one is going to be the natural numbers. The natural numbers are this funny symbol N that you can get out in LaTeX with slash math B B curly brace capital letter N curly brace dollar sign. Slash BB is the set of numbers 0, 1, 2, 3. Four, five, six, seven, and I'm done writing them all, and it just keeps on going to infinity. So this is a set with a countably infinite size. Are we all okay with natural numbers? We're going to contrast that with the integers, which are like dot, 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 
Oh, yeah, great question. We are going to get to countably infinite and uncountably infinite. Let's just do it right after this next set. Negative seven, negative six, negative five, dot, 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 zero, dot, 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 five. I don't know why I'm choosing five, six, and seven to be the ones that I show you in this example. It's not very obvious. So the integers here are going to be all the numbers from negative infinity, like all the whole numbers from negative infinity, all the way up to negative seven, negative six, negative five, negative four, negative three, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and all the way up to positive infinity. So the natural numbers include zero. Renee, I'm going to include zero in my natural numbers. Yes. I believe it is common to include zero in the natural numbers these days, though my understanding, and I will happily be proven wrong or shown to be wrong, my understanding is um, uh, some Asian countries do not include zero as a natural number. That's as far as I know. When I want to exclude the natural numbers, I'm going to stick a subscript plus. I mean, when I want to exclude zero from the natural numbers, I'm going to stick a plus subscript on the bottom of that n. OK, good talk. Is everybody okay with my capital Z here? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so there's some examples of numbers. Uh, the question came up, what is the difference between countably infinite and uncountably infinite? Do we all have a working definition in our heads of one-to-one -one functions? Yes, no. OK, yeah. so I'm just going to do a quick definition of one-to-one -one functions. Functions that are one-to-one -one map uniquely one number in the Can I hold off on all of this? I'm going to give us some examples of functions here before the end of the lecture. And I think it'll be a little bit more interesting if I draw pictures. Yeah, Edward, that sounds fine. Thanks. I'm going to answer the question about the difference between uncountably infinite and countably infinite in two, maybe three slides. Here we go. First, some more examples of sets using set builder notation. So sometimes you want to describe a set based on some properties. We can do that using set builder notation. So sometimes you want to describe the set C, and you want to say it's x such that x is in the set of 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. OK, you ready for this messed up world? This is called set builder notation. It starts with some way to create elements. In this case, we're creating elements by just listing them as x. So we're going to say x such that this colon here is to be read as such that x is in the set 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Now, this is really obnoxious way to write the set of even numbers positive even numbers. But set builder notation turns out to be incredibly helpful. Let's try another one. Um, oh, uh, Brendan asks, is there a reason to prefer colon to pipe? So here, let me give you an example with pipe to show that there's no real reason uh, to prefer colon to pipe. So we could have the set D that consists of all the elements in R such that 
Oh, whoops, I told you I was going to give you the pipe next. Pipe A is less than or equal to X, less than or equal to B. OK, so Brandon asked the question, and I'm going to try to answer it in my second example here of set builder notation. What's the difference between colon, which I'm introducing, and pipe, which some other people use? And the answer is almost nothing. It's complete preference by the current writer. So my second set D here is all of the elements in the real numbers, x in the real numbers, given such that, or, you know, uh, however you want to read this, such that A is less than or equal to X and X is less than or equal to B. That is essentially the interval A to B, which is the more common notation for it. So it turns out this set builder notation is a way for us to describe a little bit more formally how the set enclosed by curly braces should be formed. There's like instructions for what to do with the elements, given some constraints on the elements. OK. So um, another one is the rational numbers. The rational numbers are all numbers that you can write as a fraction, such that p is in the integers and q uh, is not equal to zero. OK, this is pretty good. Let's do one more example, just because nobody's saying anything and examples are helpful. Um, X in R such that A is less than X is less, oh wait, I already used A. Let's just pick different numbers, C and D. Okay, this looks like the same example I gave you for D, but in fact it's not simply because this here is strictly less than instead of less than or equals above. And when we write that as an interval, we will commonly use a left parenthesis to denote strictly less than. Excuse and me, whenever right. we write uh, less than or equal, we'll use a square bracket. And it could go the other way, but I think Harmon's got a question first. Uh, for the set of the Q, do you have to say that they have the greatest common divisor of one or something like that? Um, I don't think you have to, Okay. but some people will choose to do so. Uh, PE here, this is my integers letter, capital Z, and I make it bold like I've been making my natural numbers n and my rational numbers q and my real numbers r. OK, I think that was the question. What is this yeah, letter z here? Great. OK, I promised you I'd get to answering countably versus uncountably infinite sets in three slides. This was my first. So I'm going to take one more opportunity here to list out some subsets. OK, here is an ordering of subsets. And let's put our. Um, let's put little notes on this just so that we remember what these silly symbols mean. Natural numbers without zero.
natural numbers, integers. This is my attempt at a recap of some of the symbols we just introduced, um, rationals, and reals. So the real numbers, as far as this class is going to be concerned, is essentially like the biggest set we're going to work with. The real numbers has elements in it that are not included in the rationals. Can somebody name some real numbers that are not included in the rationals? Pi e square root of two. Those are perfect examples. Elements of R that are not elements of Q. Okay, pi is a number, we call it a real number, that cannot be written as a fraction. That turns out to be pretty cool and pretty meaningful. It comes down to some details that you should definitely go talk to the um, number theory people in the math department. But it essentially comes down to something like, have you ever tried, uh, well, I can't even ask if you've ever tried to, it's impossible. Pi as a number, 3.14159296 something, uh, will go on forever. The decimal expansion of pi is unending as far as we know in the world of math, which leads us back to you cannot write it as a fraction of some sort of integer and some non-zero number. Similar sort of statement with e, and crazily enough, a similar sort of statement happens with square root of two. For the most part, we're gonna be dealing with uh, real numbers in this class. So we're gonna be dealing with this biggest set of one dimensional numbers that exists that includes elements like the rationals, but also pi, e, and square root of two. Okay, so if you follow this, what we're essentially saying is that the natural numbers without zero is a subset of the natural numbers. The natural numbers is a subset of the integers. The integers is a subset of the rationals. The rationals is a subset of the real numbers. But there's a catch here. The catch is all of these sets, or well, some of these sets in some sense have different sizes. So this is me working my way towards our discussion of functions and the difference between countably and uncountably infinite. If we keep it to the easy examples, the natural numbers has a smaller size than the real numbers, even though they're both infinite sets. Okay, I'm gonna say that again, because that's a little tricky. The natural numbers is an infinite set. When you list out all of the positive integers, all the positive whole numbers, you will never stop writing out positive whole numbers. It goes off to infinity. It is an infinite set. However, there are more numbers in the infinite set, the real numbers, than there are in the natural numbers. OK, I'm going to try to do a hand wavy explanation of why. The natural numbers cannot be mapped to the real numbers in a one to one fashion. So here's where we go. Functions. In this class, we're often going to write functions like this. We're going to say that a function f maps from one set to another set. And the way I want you to think of that is like this. There's two sets, t and s. f is a function that maps us from elements in s to t. So this is what the function f does. It takes us from elements 
let's say here, x, two elements in t, f of x. Have people seen this kind of notation for uh, functions before? Yes. Mapping a little bit. Yeah. OK. So we're going to use this kind of notation for functions because there's a certain class of functions in the world of statistics. OK, I'm getting a few no's, so I'm glad we're going over this. There's a certain class of functions in the world of statistics that depend on the domain and the codomain. In the world of statistics, there is a certain class of functions that very heavily depend on the domain being a certain size, which we're about to explain, and the codomain having certain properties. In the world of statistics, there's a whole class of functions we're going to be very interested in throughout the rest of the semester that depends on the size of the domain, the set you're starting in, and some properties of the codomain, the set you map into. Okay, so here we're finally getting to this definition. One-to-one -one functions map elements of the domain to exactly one element of t. So let me give you an example of a one-to-one -one function. This is really boring, but it is a good enough example. The function x Should have used more solid lines for all of that, but I think you guys get the idea. The function x, f of x is equal to x, is a one to one function because exactly one function in the domain, think of that as the real numbers on the x axis, gets mapped to exactly one number on the codomain. Think of that as the vertical axis. Okay, I have an eye on the time, but I just have uh, one minute left worth of examples. So here we go. Here's an example of a non one to one function. I have not perfected my drawing of functions yet on a computer, so you'll have, to, um, you'll have to put up with it. Notice that both x equals to 2 and x equals to negative 2 get mapped to the same point in the code domain. For the function f of x equals to x squared, it is not 1 to 1 because both negative 2 and 2 get mapped to 4. So we are not uniquely mapping elements of S to exactly one element of T. Okay, so here's the answer, Brendan. It's taken forever, I understand, but thanks for your patience. The natural numbers is countably infinite because there is no one-to-one -one mapping from the natural numbers into the real numbers. And we'll say more about this when we're not running out of time. What was that second um, where you drew the parabola? What was that called? It's not a one-to-one -one function. It was called something else. Uh, it's just a function. Just a function. Yeah, it just does not fit the definition of one-to-one. -one. OK, it's just not a one-to-one. -one it's function. just not one-to-one -one function, right? right.
Okay, we are out of time. So if you have to bail, I totally understand. Thanks for letting me run up to the end here. I will try to address again the difference between countably and uncountably infinite so we can practice with it in the future. The essential idea is sets are countably infinite if they have a one-to-one -one function mapping into the natural numbers. R, the set of real numbers, cannot be mapped into the natural numbers because there's just too many numbers. So there is no one-to-one -one mapping into the natural numbers. So R is a bigger size of infinity. We call it uncountably infinite. Okay, well, thanks for your time. Thank I'm you. going to stop the recording now, but if people have questions, I'm happy to answer them.